um, and, and I'll talk about here. I'm Ken Gilroy. Um, I was a commander of a detachment in the 59th, and I was executive officer of one of the groups in the 59th Lawrence Brigade at a second time. So I've seen these guys over a number of years, um, and I think I have a pretty good understanding of what they were supposed to do. Um, <coughs> we called it SASCOM, Special Ammunition Support Command, not always in flattering terms. Uh, you know, SASCOM wasn't always a fun thing to say, but and later it became the 59th Lawrence Brigade. When I got there, uh, most people still called it SASCOM, although the name had officially changed. But later it was the 59th Lawrence Brigade. There's its mission, is to take care of the nuclear weapons in theater, the whole theater, uh, including down in Greece and Turkey, whatever. So it's a, it's a big job in terms of the space that it, it it's theater-wide. So it's a big job for that. It did, did not handle Air Force weapons, all right? handle tactical nuclear weapons for whoever was going to was going to use them. Uh, some engineer weapons, uh, short range rockets and missiles. The Navy Crockett's. Yes, uh, the Nike Hercules missiles, and then later even the even the Persian twos. Uh, I was in that unit too when we signed the INF treaty, uh, and flipped from deploying the missiles to uh, removing the missiles. That's kind of an interesting story in itself, but that's not what this is about. Uh, so they're responsible for security, safety, maintenance, transportation, all those things uh, that happened. Chemical weapons included, and that was part of the problem because really not a lot of people knew how to handle chemical weapons. Uh, but okay. Uh, all right, here's the organization. Just to say, here's who these guys were. It was mostly centered around Permacense, which is down south of Ramstein, uh, uh, in a, a fairly easy to de physically to defend area, although if you get overwhelmed, nothing's easy to defend physically. Um, but in the Permacense area, there are some of the units that you see, the ordnance companies, the PAL, you know what PAL is? Permissive Action Link. In essence, it's a combination lock <coughs> on the warhead itself. Uh, and some of the, those, like the smaller weapons, like the 155 millimeter cannon, it was actually a combination lock. That would, it was about this big and would fit on top of the, war, of the round itself. And some of them, it was an electronic lock, but it was power, permissive action link. And when you got the message to use weapons or to issue the weapons to the foreign uh, excuse me, to the foreign forces that we were dealing with, you would also get a PAL link in a separate message. And it was a U.S. only message, so the Germans wouldn't get it. So, in my case, the Germans. It could be the Dutch, the Belgians, the Turks, it could be anybody else. Uh, and then only the U.S. could unlock the thing. And that was part of the <coughs> part of the test that we used to go through all the time when you would issue these weapons. You would only have so much time, you'd have to issue the weapon, you'd have to verify the Germans would sign for it, and then you'd have to unlock it. If you had the unlock code, you had to unlock the weapon. That meant, though, if you unlocked it, you were going to fire it. Until you got, sometimes you could, you could get the message to transfer the weapons, but not unlock them, which meant somebody still hadn't made the final decision yet uh, to do this. And there was an aviation detachment, mostly to move things around. You had some ordnance battalions, and I'll show them to you in a second, who were the maintenance guys, and then you had artillery groups uh, scattered from the North Sea down to Turkey uh, to, to handle the weapons and to actually do the liaison with the foreign company, with the foreign governments. All right, they're the maintenance battalions. Misal, Misal, Fischbach, they're all in the general vicinity of Permacence. I don't know how familiar you are with the geography of all this. They each had maintenance companies and MP companies and they were for different things. Some were for counter weapons, some were for rocket missile weapons, some were for engineer weapons, depending on what you were doing. All right? uh, MP companies were the security people because they all had weapon sites. You had to have guards at the weapon sites. That's what the MP companies were for. Okay. Generally, generally speaking, the ordnance battalions, I'm not going to go into any, every one of them because they're as important as they are they were not a real part of my experience 
but they the, they had a real job to do there. They kept the theater stocks uh, over and above what we had deployed. Uh, for example, I commanded a, a detachment that had a weapon site. We had Honest John rockets, or we would had the rockets. We had the warheads. We had warheads for 155 and 8 inch howitzers. Uh, and then they would transport them to and from the field units as needed. Right? It's the artillery groups. Uh, I'm more familiar with this, and I was the executive officer of one of these groups. You had the weapons for a non NATO elements division or higher. So these detachments from north to south would line up with a NATO division of some sort Netherlands, German, uh, sometimes British. Um, or Italian or whoever, and they would then hold the weapons that were going to be used if the order was given to use them. All right? um, you had to have a U.S. authority to release the weapons. So you had this, uh, a major part of what you did was this uh, communication system with seal authenticators. So if you got a message, uh, you had to decode the message quickly. You had to authenticate it properly, and these authenticators were incredibly sensitive uh, it took two-person control. Not one person could do this. Two people had to do it simultaneously. Uh, and then you would validate the message. Uh, you had detachments deployed within NATO elements, and I'll show that to you in a second. And you had one ordnance company with each division. They held the immediate resupply of weapons. So, for example, I had, I think the number was six, six I had six 155 millimeter projectiles that I could that I could hand over. If I did that and we were still using more, I would get them some more from the ordnance company. And after that, they would come from one of those ordnance battalions I just showed you. Okay? These are the, these are the low, low level guys on the ground. Weapon storage sites. Uh, this is a detachment of about 35 or 40 people, American soldiers, um, together with host nation forces. I commanded one at Phillipsport, which is at Solemn Concern. It's about 25 kilometers south of Heidelberg, which is unusual because it was in the middle of the U.S. area and the attachments didn't work with U.S. forces. My, in my case, the mission was with the 12th German Armored Division, which later came under the command of U.S. 7th Corps. Right? <coughs> and you had tactical teams for each of those systems. Right? Those are the systems we had, 155, 8 inch Honest John. Now, what's this all about? All right? uh, we only use nuclear weapons, or at least so the theory was, if we're in imminent danger of a serious, not a tactical defeat, but an operational or a strategic defeat. In other words, the Soviets have done so much damage or have broken through in one or more places that's so dangerous that the only way it was resolved to stop them was to use nuclear weapons. So it had to be, had to be pretty bad, right? which was possible. It was entirely possible. And the Soviets knew this too. Uh, oddly enough, in, in a later uh, later life, I was studying to be and was going to become the chief of the arms control unit in Frankfurt, Germany, and I was you know, dealing with the Soviets, and I talked to, uh, once, right here, because I was at Ohio State at the Mershon Center, to Ambassador Grinevsky, uh, who was the Soviet guy who negotiated the treaty for conventional forces in Europe. And I asked him about how the Soviets were looking at these things. And he said, at least during Gorbachev's time, and maybe a little bit before that, he said the Russian forces were ready to go. He said they were ready to roll, and they wanted to. Uh, now, they never did. And of course, we know that now, but you couldn't know that back then. Uh, but I told him about this, and he said, he said they were aware of what the capabilities were and the Soviet forces, the military side of the Soviet high command, was saying to the politicians and to the diplomats, we can succeed. Turn us loose. Now, that, when you think about that, that's pretty scary. Uh, I was one of those guys. I didn't relish having to actually face the Soviets, although you prepare as best you can. All right. uh, so there was, a there was always a danger of escalation. And we knew that if the Soviets came and they were that good, it was going to escalate. Now, a lot of people were worried about that, but even now I'm talking at general global level. The first time you use a nuclear weapon, does that mean it becomes uncontrolled and anybody can do whatever he wants? 
and nobody can answer that question. Um, and then, uh, so because it was that important, everything we did at that detachment level, now I'm a captain, all right, um, with 30 something guys uh, dealing with a Soviet, not a Soviet, a German colonel who's the regimental artillery commander uh, or the artillery regimental commander for this division. And we got to make sure things work together, and we did. So I, it's a pretty low level. So every now and then we get a lot of attention, and I had occasion to brief the ambassador to NATO one time. He came to visit my unit, Donald Rumsfeld. Mm -hmm. Shows up at Phillipsburg, Germany, and wants to know what we're doing. So we showed it. So Mr. Ambassador, here it is, ABCD. He asked a lot of good questions. I don't think he got every answer that he wanted, but he, gave, he got every answer that I had to give him. Uh, he seemed to be satisfied. He thanked us for it. I never heard anything else about it after that. Boy, you screwed this one up, or you did that okay, or whatever. He seemed to be okay with it. All right. Okay. So what happens every day? Here you are at this site. In my case, it was called a remote site. It wasn't actually that remote. We were in the middle of a cluster of U.S. Forces facilities. So in terms of a, having a, a decent <coughs> style of life, it was okay. But there were some of these units that were up in the in the Hunsruck, uh and up around Munster Hondorf and whatever, and they were, we're, we're talking isolated. We're talking it's an hour and a half to two hours to get to the nearest PX, and that one might be in Geeson, which was no big deal. Uh, but you didn't have medical care, you didn't have all the, it could be a tough life. It could also be pretty rewarding because you're sort of on your own, you're left alone, but you get a high level of scrutiny. This PRP, Personal Reliability Program, was a big deal. Everybody had to be screened. Any drug use, any illnesses, any other things could be disqualifying. It was a problem on a lot of the NATO sites. For example, in ours, when you go to the German doctor for a cold, you get some cough syrup or whatever, and have codeine in it. Mm -hmm. You get drug tested, you got codeine in your system, you got drugs in your system, you see. So this happens sometimes. If you got somebody who's disqualified because of personal liability program, now you got a real problem where the United States Army of Europe is getting on your case saying, these guys aren't qualified, you're not doing your job. Uh, it could be pretty hard. Lack of U.S. facilities is a bad thing, and of course the language barrier. Now every detachment was supposed to have at least two officers who spoke German or whatever the native language, Dutch, French if you were in the Belgian unit or whatever, Greek, Turkey, uh, Turkish, or whatever. Uh, sometimes you had more. Uh, we did and we had a couple of uh, civilian, a couple of, not civilians, a couple of enlisted people who also spoke German, which made a huge difference. But it wasn't automatic. Right? And it could be difficult. Uh, yeah, some other, yeah, it, did, it didn't get all the slides on here, right? That's not your fault. There was a, there was a list of the groups and the, yeah. and the detachments. I, we, we took this from my computer last night and put it on here, and it didn't transfer all the slides. Um, what these facilities look like? Yeah, they're, they're on a German concern, so it's a small unit uh, that has, in my case, had two battalions there, uh, an eight-inch battalion and an Honest John battalion. The Honest John was, were the guys that we worked most closely with. Uh, this so is what at, years? Say again? What years that you were This is 74 to 77, okay. middle of 77. Right before the Honest Johns were phased out. Right. We still had the Honest Johns. Um, and then the site was outside of town. In our case, it was about five clicks away. Okay. Uh, down a, a regular road, not an Audubon or whatever, and then a small forest road to get to it, although it was a, it was a hard surface road. Mm -hmm. The idea is partially camouflaged, partially easy to protect, but it's in the woods. And a lot of them were exactly that way. We had two bunkers, uh, two complete full service bunkers uh, with big steel doors, you know, these uh, gigantic locks that were about that big on them, you know, these big thick high security things. Uh, everything was two man control. Nobody could go anywhere by himself. You always had to do something with another person. That was part of the personnel reliability program. Uh, we had a building there inside the concern that was ours. 
We also had a, a communications site next door with a big tower. That was our uh, communications for strategic communications with uh, either USER or UCOM headquarters to somebody. We could talk to the United States on, on these things. Uh, so that's, that's what was there. We had some rooms where people lived on the concern. Other people lived in the town, in my case, the town of Phillipsburg, and the local German administration office got us quarters. Uh, and frankly, it was a good deal. I had a two-bedroom apartment or a three-bedroom apartment that cost 40 bucks a month. Now, and we were lucky because Phillipsburg is close to facilities where if I needed to go to a commissary, or I could. I could go pretty quickly. I could get to Heidelberg in 30 minutes or less. That wasn't true for most of the detachments. So I have to say, I, in that instance, for that piece of it, I was lucky. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these guys were way out, literally, in the boonies um, at that time. And it was very difficult for them to do that. And hard on the families. Um, some of these places, uh, like Hairborn, where I was the executive officer of the group, actually had its own little grammar school right there. Uh, oh, so the wives were allowed to be there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this okay. was on a company tour. Okay. Now, you didn't have to come with your spouse, yeah. but most people did. And in our case, the Germans, normally the spouses were only allowed for NCOs and above. Uh, we had some uh, lower-ranking enlisted people who would come with spouses, and the Germans would find quarters for them. Not everybody did that. This was something they just did for us, and, and it worked well. Uh, and our guys appreciate it. So I, I can't really complain about that part. I have mm -hmm. to say that was okay. Were there about the same number of weapons at each site? Roughly. If it was an artillery detachment like mine yeah. that worked with a division, you had 8-inch Honest John 155. Nike Hercules had the warheads for the, for the missiles. Uh, there were a couple of sergeant missiles or early version of Pershing missiles, right. Pershing 1 missiles as opposed to Pershing. Pershing 2 never was part of that. It was all part of U.S. forces. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the way these weapons. Now, there were also in um, in the group weapon sites, so the Ordnance Company sites, some atomic demolition munitions, which were for engineers. But those did not go down to detachment level. Um, if the Germans wanted to use those to create roadblocks or blockages or something, engineer obstacles, um, that would be at the division level, so we didn't, or the core level, so we didn't get that, uh, which was okay. But those weapons were there and available uh, and could be used. Uh, we had an engineer platoon at the headquarters that would train on atomic demolition munitions. That's what they did. Now, were the Honest Johns kept in one bunker and the eight inches and kept in another? Or they mixed? Normally, yes. Uh, but I can't tell you what the configuration was in every bunker, because the Honest John is a, was a pretty big thing. Yeah. It was a it was a can about the size of, as long as this table, maybe a little longer, and about twice as wide. You would have to have a hoist to get the, the top off of it, and then you'd have it. And all we had was the warhead. We didn't have the rocket. We would sign the warhead over to the Germans. They would mate it to the rocket. Uh, of course, we would use the PAL to unlock it first. Right. Um, they would then hand the warhead to the Germans. Did they you would have to unlock each and every weapon? Each one had a lock on it. Each one had a lock. The, the easiest one, of course, was the 155. It was literally, it was a combination lock. It was, it was a big round thing about this big. It would fit over the top of a round. Yeah. And you had a combination lock. You had a dial a combination lock. Uh, and then when, it, when, it, you know, when you finished with it, there was, a, I think, a couple of uh, these little things you could squeeze. You could tell it would unlock. Then you could turn it a quarter turn it come off. Now was that a complete shell or was that just the case? That's the whole, it's the whole 155 round, not the powder. 155 is separate loading ammunition. Right. You have, a, you, have a, 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 you have the round itself, the yeah. shell, and then you have the powder that's separate. And the 8-inch was also just the shell? S same thing. 8-inch okay. was, was the same. The 8-inch one was more difficult to, to deal with because it had different yields. You could have a higher... Yeah, it's a dial or yield. Say again? You could dial the yield? No, you, it wasn't dial yield in this case. In this case, there were actually rings, and you would have uranium rings that you, Dampers. Would, you would put on it depending on what the yield was yeah. that you had to do. You know the difference between an implosion bomb and a gun-type bomb? Right. Yeah. Okay. 155 was an implosion bomb. 
okay. add a little bit of plutonium in it so yeah. that it would compress the core and that's where you get the nuclear explosion. Yeah. The eight inch was like the, Hir the it was Hiroshima, like the Hiroshima bomb, bomb was a real gun. Where, it, where, it was a, where you would fire uh, a neutron bullet through the rings that would create the... So the more rings, the bit larger Well, the uh, it, Yeah, there were different sizes for different yields, but you're right. It, it wasn't so much one, two, three rings, you get this. It was yeah. the configuration of them. But you would essentially fire a gun-type neutron pellet through the rings. That would create the, new, the critical, critical mass, mass, and you would get a nuclear explosion. Oh, interesting. Now, the Honest John obviously was an implosion. Yes, and the Honest John was, uh, of course, it was a single yield. You couldn't... Right. Couldn't manipulate that. I mean, you would get the warhead. And those were about five kilotons. I, I don't remember. I, I don't mean to, to put you off. I just don't. I think I remember that the honest shots. Were I, I, I wanted. I think five kt is right, but the one five five ones, for example, were just about a half kt or yeah. a quarter, because you weren't you weren't trying to destroy all kinds of things. You were trying to hit a specific target in a specific place for a specific purpose to stop an attack or. To, hit an assembly area or a reserve unit, you know, something like that. Usually it was an assembly area or yeah, a some concentration. Like that. That's correct. Do you want just the 557 units or you want the 59? You got them all? Well, I got two different pages here. Show me. Okay. All right. This back in for you. Yeah. I'm sorry about this. Oh, that's when, when we transferred the slides, it didn't come out exactly right. Let's see, Let's see what, what Brian can do to help us here. Um, I was the commander of the and, and he'll show you when we get the list up here, of the 3rd Artillery Detachment in Phillipsburg. Um, there were a lot of advantages to that because you're close to U.S. facilities. The disadvantage was that when you got a visitor like Donald Rumsfeld and the United States Army of Europe wanted to show him a weapons detachment, they'd take him to Phillipsburg because it was close. Yeah. And you could get there and back pretty quickly. So we had a lot of visitors that other units never had to put up with. So that's yeah, just your 557. If you want the 59, it's on the other tab. I can pull that up when you're ready. Uh, here's the 557. I don't know how easy it is to see, but 96 Ordnance Company, 3rd Artillery Detachment, that was mine, 7th Artillery Detachment, uh, 30th, the 83rd, which was the Pershing 1 and the Sergeant Unit. Okay. And then the 85th, I'm sorry, the 85th was the Pershing 1. Uh, so we had, we supported three of uh, the divisions in the German 3rd Corps, right, which included the 12th Panzer Division, but later the 12th Panzer Division was switched operationally to the U.S. 7th Corps. Okay. And we had a big, huge meeting uh, in Tappelbischersheim, where the artillery headquarters was for the 12th Panzer Division, and went over this with U.S. and German uh, units to, to make this switch. And I met a whole bunch of U.S. artillerymen there that I didn't know, people from the 72nd Artillery Brigade, one of whom later turned out to be my battalion commander when I was back in the United States. Yeah. And they asked me to, you know, this was a, we did this as an exercise, part of a, part of a scenario of the Russians are going to attack and here's what the 12th Division is going to do. Uh, and at each stage of this thing, the regimental commander, the, the German guy, would say, okay, table number six, give us your solution to this, and you go up to the map. And this is in the gym, so there's this huge map up there, um, and you're giving your answer to the scenario. Well, when it came time to a certain point, he says, table number seven, or whatever it was, well, that was where I was. Well, he had set me up, but I didn't know that. Um, and the guy who was there said, okay, Captain Gilder's going to give our answer. Well, I had to go up and give the answer, but I had to give it in German, which was fine. I could do it, and I did it just fine, but it impressed the hell out of some of the Americans who were there because they didn't know I was there. Uh, at least they didn't know that the 12th Division had an American unit with it, which is what we were, the 3rd Artillery Detachment. So this guy who later turned out to be my battalion commander, he told me, he said, that impressed the hell out of everybody there. You did this whole thing in German. And I said, yes, sir, that's what we've been doing for the last three years, was dealing with this stuff in German. So turned out, turned out pretty good. I enjoyed it. it was, a little bit of a war story there. Was your solution to use the nuclear weapons? No. <laughs> no. We just gave the solution of where we would be and what we'd be moving and how we would do it. Of course, like, I would impress the Americans wasn't the solution, but that I gave the whole thing in German. And were they expecting the movement through the Ardennes? Like the, like, well, not at that point because the German 12th Panzer Division was down below the U.S. 5th Division, uh, fifth, uh, sorry, the 8th Infantry Division, which was in the Fuller Gap. We're a little bit south of that. Yeah. So, 
Geographically, that's where it was. Yeah, so I think they of, still expected it to come through the, the, the low stretch of the Netherlands. It was sort of south central, south central west Germany, yeah. uh, not up in the northern part. That's where the British forces were. They were up in the Netherlands? Um, the, the, uh, the just, below, just below that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. just below that. Just as they know, also the Persian unit was married up with the German Air Force, not the Germans. Correct. The, Germans, the Persian units and the Germans um, system married up with, with German Air Force, not German Army like it would in our Oh, really? And later, when the, the 56th Field Artillery Command, which was the U.S. Persian unit, yeah. um, actually, when I left, in 85, 86, I was the executive officer of this group, the 557th Artillery Group, uh, of which the 3rd Detachment was part. Um, and I left from there to go be the G5 at the 56th Field Artillery Command, which was the Pershing II unit. Oh. So I got to see this from a different angle. Well, you must have been there when they first came online. Uh, right after that. But I was also there when the INF Treaty was signed right in the middle, and we had to go one day from deploying the weapons to the next day removing the that weapons. That was what, 84, 85? Uh, 87. 80, 86 is when the treaty was made, I, and then 87 was when it went into effect and we had to... How long were the Persian twos there? I don't remember the exact date. It was the dual track decision um, with Ronald Reagan and Helmut Schmidt mm -hmm. saying we're going to enter into negotiations because the SS-20s that the Soviets deployed, right. but at the same time the dual track is we're going to continue to deploy these weapons. And I don't know if you remember reading the newspapers and whatever back then, but it was it was pretty sensitive. Oh yeah. And there were a lot of uh, a lot of people following us around, wanting to protest against the the Pershing twos being there. So we did a lot of work with the German police and others trying to head off these kinds of problems. And I I was in the middle of all that because I was the liaison officer between the German military forces and police and the. 56 field artillery command, uh, but interesting stuff. I mean, really was. Uh, oh man. So. But now the Pershing twos were not uh, associated with the American Air Force. No, okay. it was the American Army. It was the American and, Army. And so it was only the Pershings that were aff affiliated with the Luftwaffe. Correct, the Pershing ones. Yeah. Uh, the, it was not just the Pershing twos, but also the ground launch cruise missiles, um, were in addition part of the treaty. Right. Right, which were U.S. Air Force weapons. Yeah. Uh, the cruise missiles were Air Force, not Army. And the ones that the Germans were, that the Russians were worried about were the Pershing twos. I mean, let's call it spade a spade. That was, what, that were, was the dangerous Well, one. and we were worried about the SS-20s. Yes, but the Pershing two is far, uh, agreed. Pershing two is far better than the SS-20 okay. in terms of comparing missiles. The problem was, if the Russians had the missiles there and we didn't do anything about it, the, the Russians would have succeeded without firing any of the missiles because they would have decoupled the United States from NATO. They could threaten NATO, but there was nothing NATO could do to the Russians. That's what the Pershing twos gave NATO. Gave us the ability to do something to the Russians. And the Russians knew it. That's why they made the treaty. Um, one of the guys would ask, we'd go around and do briefings on these missiles. One of the guys would ask us, how fast is a missile? And my answer was always, well, it's classified. But I can tell you this, if I fire the missile from here, somewhere into the Western Soviet Union, uh, it'll be there before you can finish smoking a cigarette. I've got to think about it for a second. That's pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. And they had a pretty good yield on those, too. There, there were different yields, but you're right. They had a pretty good yield. And they were also pretty accurate. They were um, very accurate. Yeah. The issue well, was less yield than accuracy. That's correct. <laughs> um, it had a radar deflecting. Uh, apparatus in the nose cone so that as it turned, as the warhead would turn earthward, uh, the radar would come on, it would, con it was it was almost like a laser, it would beam back and it would continue to adjust to hit exactly mm -hmm. the spot. The limiting factor on the accuracy of the Pershing twos was the map data that went into the nose cone, not the missile itself. If you gave it map data that was accurate to one millimeter, that's what it would hit. That's how accurate it was. Well, so the guys would ask us, how accurate is it? I said, well, I can't tell you that either. It's classified. And I said, but if you show me a football field in the Western Soviet Union, I can, I can shoot a goal for you. And yeah. that, that would get their attention. And too, it, was, right? it was going to take out the, the, the Soviet staging areas and their um, and command and control. Command control. Also, their, um, 
They're uh, vehicles. <laughs> they're, well, they're vehicle storage and staging areas. But if you could, uh, that was the, the command and control is really what they were worried about. Oh, okay. Because if we could identify where a division or an army level command post was, all right, and we mm -hmm. knew where it was, I mean, we could hit it within minutes before it could pack up and go anywhere. Uh, it was gone. Uh, and they knew that. Uh, so that's part of what drove them to the table. Uh, that and the ability of the cruise missiles to avoid detection. Yeah. Uh, the cruise missiles weren't as accurate as the as the Persians. Oh, really? Not quite. Uh, they probably are today, but they weren't. Yeah. This is 1985, 86, right. 87. Okay. But the Russians were still worried about it. The cruise missiles took a little longer to get there. Yeah. That's why they were afraid of the Persians. Things happen so fast with the Persians. If, if we could fire it, if we got the message to fire it, we could have one in the air in five minutes or less. Well, wait, you'd have to retrieve the can. No, that this is U.S. units. We're not giving them to the, to the, oh, to so the Germans. Were they, but they were, the, the, the warhead was still being stored. So the warhead was missile. still being stored, but if we had to deploy them, the warheads were on Oh, See, okay. We put them on there. So, uh, so it, uh, I mean, we, we could do, and one of the things we do on our exercise, we go out on our exercise somewhere, and we had missiles. Some of them were dummy missiles, some of them were training, some of them were not, but you couldn't tell. Right. So the Russians didn't know this, so we'd go out and we'd tell one battalion, the whole battalion. I'm trying to remember how many missiles that were, I think it was 36. We could tell the whole battalion, you know, set up and elevate the missiles, erect the missiles so that they're in the firing position. We could do the whole battalion at one time. 27, 9 per battery. 27, uh, not the Pershing, so a little bit, I don't know. Pershing was 9 per battery, 3 batteries. Three okay, batteries. anyway, we would erect all these missiles, and the Soviets think, oh my God, they fire these things. You see, now, a lot of them were training missiles, but the Soviets didn't know that. Did, were, 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 were there several missiles armed at all times? Yes. Oh, they were? Yes. Okay. For a with, real, with real warheads. Real now those are mobile launchers, right? Absolutely. Yeah. They're in a big uh, MAN uh, vehicle that was towed, uh, and they were good. They were good at what they did. Yeah. Now that again, I'm, I've gotten off topic, but that's not no, the that's, Thornton's brigade, but it's that's, nuclear weapons. Yeah, that's uh, And I happen to be in that unit too, uh, although that wasn't part of what I was doing here. Yeah, that I know that the real concern there was that if there was going to be a strategic exchange, it was going to start with the Pershing and the SS20s. It flyers. could have started with the 155 round. Because it was a nuclear weapon. In other words, if one yeah. one fires a nuclear weapon, you can get a nuclear weapon fired back. And a lot of people were worried about that, thinking that the United States thought that it could use nuclear weapons. The Russians and, were worried about that. And get away with it. In other words, they could use nuclear weapons and the Russians wouldn't do something in return. The problem was, until they had the SS-20s, the Russians didn't have a weapon they could use in retaliation. Uh -huh. We had the tactical nuclear weapons. They didn't. That was the problem. Uh, so it, it was, it was a big deal. Okay, I got off the topic a little bit. Yeah, that was good. I'm happy to do other questions or whatever I can. How many how many weapons in a bunker? Uh, it would depend on the bunker. In ours, I had, I know I had 12 Honest Johns. I had six 155s and 8-inch. I had six Honest Johns in each bunker. Uh, I think six 8-inch <coughs> rounds in one bunker and six 155s in the this other. This wasn't a very big bunker. There were two bunkers. <coughs> Again, they were... As you went inside the bunker, it was about half the size of this one. Oh, that's a big, small bunker. big double door in the front, you know, with a roller that you yeah. could open it with. Uh, otherwise, a, 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 you know, the chamfer cut. Reinforced concrete. Reinforced all the way concrete around. all the way around. Earth covered. Probably you know. still there. Oh, I'm sure there are, unless somebody's demolished. Yes, sir. I have some questions actually. Um, I often I miss part of the presentation. I'm not supposed Please. To I'm working in a desk and things too, so I'm sort of, that's why I'm sort of floating towards the back. Glad you're here. Um, so what, the time you were there at 155s were at that point now the smallest thing that the... Except for the atomic demolition munitions. Except for the yes, demolition. Sir. This is long after they phased out things like Davy Crockett. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we didn't yeah. have any Davy Crockett's. Those were gone by that time. Yeah. When I got there in 74, we had 155, 8-inch, Pershing 1s, and Sergeant missiles, mm. which later then yeah. turned Pershing. over. Okay. Do you know... Um, do you know that the Brits have their own stuff separate? Yes. Or, okay. We knew that. We knew that. Um, and also third, I guess for the uh, you mentioned about the uh, Nike Herx. Um, so we 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 actually did have warheads for that. that we, we had we had there. some air defense detachments. When I first got there, the, the unit got 
um, reconfigured between the time I was the commander at the 3rd Detachment in Phillipsburg and the time I came back to the same group as the executive officer. Um, so this was 77 till 85, so eight years. Uh, when I was there, we had two um, air defense detachments, which had Nike Hercules missiles. So that was part of the group. Right. When I came back as the executive officer, those had been moved over to another group which did air defense weapons only. And we had then picked up the Persian unit, the 85th detachment, and got a Kirshen, uh, and that was it. We lost the two air defense detachments. We picked up the Persian detachment. The others were the same. Uh, but they so kept their work, those were separate from the missiles correct. at all times. Okay. Correct. So I'm used to seeing in the states where you know where Nike groups were deployed in the states, the various places where they had the silos and fixed fixed locations. That's correct. I've been in a couple of silos where they you can still see the markings for the HE warheads and the special warheads. Yeah, Nike Hercules had an HE warhead that could be used in the ground ground mode too, uh, although that wasn't the plan, of course. But they could have been used that way. Yes, sir. What about, <coughs> excuse me. What about operational security? I've read some accounts of the Soviet uh, diplomats who uh, who were in Germany who regularly were tasked to go to locations inside of Germany to, to bury weapons caches for when the balloon went up that other agents would come and get those caches and many of them were uh, RPGs that were supposed to be targeted to facilities like these when you got when the balloon went up if you were rolling out of the out of your right. bunker to hit the bunkers, right? How, how, I mean, what were I, the? I, we didn't see any of that, and we didn't have any indication that it happened where I was. I well, no, this would be like you've been given the order, the go orders, right? You're starting, you're starting to roll out. What type of operational security? I mean, did you shut down? Were you going to shut down the town? Did sure. the, the local police shut down the town? Well, we had the, the, the German forces provided security for us in our case. There was a, a security battery that worked with us of about 200 soldiers. Mm -hmm. They provided security in the site and then around it. Uh, I know that when the, if we'd been given the order to do that, whether there were any preliminary or not, one of the things they did was they swept the woods around the, uh, around the detachment up to 150 to 200 meters out. Um, now, it was pretty wooded, so can you miss something? Be sure, of course you can. Um, but generally speaking, they were pretty good at that. And they would sweep it every now and then, just for the hell of it, just to let somebody know, hey, we may do this, mm -hmm. whether you're there or not. Um, I imagine other units did had similar functions, similar ways of going about it. Uh, but once the, once the word was given that we're going to deploy, I mean, all the security measures we could think of were taken. Um, we didn't put up any extra barriers in front of the bunkers. Um, an RPG could probably have penetrated the bunker door, but I'm not sure what else it would have done. Okay, because once it did that, uh, it was probably spent and wouldn't hurt anything inside. Uh, unless well, the shell was a pretty, pretty tough bird. Uh, and they were inside. They were inside. Still I'm just other thinking of metal cans. I'm just thinking of disabling the door so you can't get out. Yeah. Well, that could have been possible now. Uh, but I'm trying to think, the only way I can think of to, to have that happen uh, was either shoot the lock, which is not that big. That's pretty hard to hit with an RPG. Uh, or the tracks that That's, the door was on. Yeah. Uh, re reading, how it's been almost 20 years since I read that memoir. Yeah. But the idea was just to give the Red Brigade and other terrorist groups just saying shenanigans. You know, make, okay. you know, you know your, I, your, your, your responsibility is to slow them down, is to cause damage, to light fires on the road, and to basically slow down. I don't America. remember. I don't remember us being that prepared in terms of the bunkers for terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. What we were prepared for were Soviet special forces. Mm -hmm. That was different. Array. And, and later, I think I heard, it was two or three years after I left, uh, they actually had U.S. Special Forces do a simulated attack on... They like that. And they and, like doing that. And they did it on ours. Oh. They got in just like that. Of course. Really? And they got, well, they were good. They were in there within two minutes. Wow. Uh, so, it, 
but that's okay. I, I say it's okay. It's not okay, but it, it's okay that they did it and they showed us oh, they, they, what they, can happen. Did they show you a way to prevent it? Yeah. Well, they showed us. They gave us certainly. They gave us some an after action review and had some hints on how to do that. Yeah. But if it happens, it happens so fast that it's hard to react to it unless you know it's coming. But there's no way those weapons could have been detonated in the hands no, of somebody. That's else. True. No, that's true. The idea is to slow down, right. disable, that's true. To, to make to make the unit ineffective. You could. Have, that's true. You could have done that. Yeah. Uh, and if you damage, if you damage the cans or you know the containers that they're in, you can in fact disable the weapons. Yes. In that the, the transport or finding out where all the bridges are that's coming out of there and making sure all the bridges are out. Well, but that's a, that's a different thing too. Yeah. I understand that, but that's a different thing. Yeah. And that is geog geography dependent on where you are. Uh, from where we were, once you got out to the, to the main road, you could go in several different directions. So for somebody to be able to have disabled that would have taken quite a bit of resources. Now in the case of the Honest John, so the cans would be transported to the missile? Yes, the cans would be transported to wherever the the deployed site was. We didn't, we didn't marry them up to the to the missiles right there in Phillipsburg. Yeah. There was a deployed area. In fact, we reconned it. We, you know, did all kinds of things with the Germans to say, here's where we'd be. Here's the initial place where you go. Here's where we'd go. So you would bring the weapons to a yes. site. Okay, now they wouldn't the come to you. The Germans would transfer them. I mean, they would, they would transport them. We didn't have any of our own vehicles. Yeah, everything was done by them. But they would pick up the weapons from the site and they would transport them to wherever the field location was, and that's where these transactions would take place. Was this an armored answer. vehicle, or was this just a normal truck? It was normal trucks for these things, no armored vehicles for them. Uh, that was all we had. Uh, you would use whatever the artillery transport was. Yeah. Uh, because again, it wasn't, you're not transporting just a 155 round, you got a can that's about half the size of this table. Right, if you're doing uh, the hottest John, yeah. And you put them, you, you tie it down the back of a vehicle. One, one can per truck, probably. Uh, it depends on what. I think we normally would transport transfer two or three per truck. So there were occasions when you actually transported them to the. To we the never we never took them out of the bunker. We would okay. we had some practice rounds that we would we would simulate what we're doing. Okay. We had to do all the procedures correctly. Okay. Um, you would do the same thing with the actual rounds. So that's the way we did it. Uh, it I, I think we did it as well as we could under the circumstances. You can you can overthink. All of this, but you got to trans. You got to practice and train for what you expect to happen, and have in your mind what would happen should something go wrong or something unexpected happen, mm -hmm. uh, and then you would respond to it. And that's pretty much the way we did. That's how you train for everything, no matter what it is. Uh, how would you speculate they're doing it today? Well, we don't do it today. Those weapons aren't there. We have no uh, nukes in. As far as I know, we don't. Now, I, Other than the air bases. I, I don't have all the classified information, so please don't, don't no, go hold me to that. Okay. I'm sure the air bases have the possibility of doing this and have the cap the U.S. has the capability of transferring weapons from one theater to another one pretty quickly. Very, very quickly. Pretty quickly. Um, and I'm, so I'm sure there are some other sites that are closer from which we can take weapons and transfer them even for the Air Force. I, I, I don't know about all the Air Force transportation procedures or whatever. Please don't ask me about no. that. That's, that's way out of my area of expertise. Typically the weapons are actually kept on the airfield. Yeah, I'm I, I'm a fan of all the services, the Air Force, the Marines, whatever, but, but they do different things and they, they do it with good reasons and with good procedures um, and they're good at it. So I, I will trust the Air Force to do the Air Force's job. It, 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 it's, it's always funny when they, uh, everyone snickers whenever they pull out the, the video of the Davy Crockett Right. But then when you get, actually go and visit Germany, you go, yeah, that was actually a pretty smart idea. You, 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 you launch it from one side of a, of a hill to lob it on the other side of the hill, yeah. and some perfectly reasonable... You, you use the weapons capabilities to their greatest advantage, whatever that is. Right. You, uh, don't, fire it, you don't fire it from a, uh, to the other side of a, of a city. You fire it where you've got a mountain between you and the... And well, you do you do what you can with it. The That's problem with the Crockett was it was very very dirty, yeah. so you were not going to be able to use that, access that site afterwards. Same right. very true. long time, right? But you didn't get the time, right? Same is true with an Honest John or anything else. You yeah. had to be careful. Pershing twos actually were much more efficient. The dangerous part of the Honest John wasn't the rocket; it was the rocket itself, yeah. because of the fuel that was. I commanded an Honest John battalion was is that it has these two fuels that come together. Both the of them. Yeah, the hypergolic. 
Well, the, the old German tea stuff and both of them yeah. individually are dangerous as hell. You put them together, they're even more dangerous. Be and that's what happens with an honest John when the fuse goes off. The two pieces of fuel come to, or the two fuel cells come together, and it sets this thing off. Yeah. It's literally an explosion inside the rocket. And that's what sets it off. Yeah, it's the, dangerous. the pictures of it when you see it launching from the back of its carrier yeah. is the flame coming out the, the, the back. And then the two jets coming out the front, and that's what we, uh, I mean, didn't we didn't we learn our lessons from watching the you know the, the experience of the Comet pilots, you know, having to wear you know asbestos flight suits, you know? And I, and later I, I commanded an MLRS battalion uh, where we had those rockets or to use the TACOMS missiles, whatever. So that was again a, a, a significant upgrade over what you saw with Honest John, or anything yeah. Else. So. Those were some interesting things. I got to see a lot of this in different stages because that's where my career sent me. Um, so in terms of what you're asking about what they do today, yeah. 59th closed down in 92. The 59th is done. It's, mm -hmm. it's out of there.